What is the thing that means more to you? Is it your bank account? Is it sex? Is it drink? Is it drugs? Is it sensual pleasure? What is it? Idolatry is anything that comes between you and God. It's where self is preferred over God so that all of us here can say in one sense we've been guilty at one time or another of idolatry. And God hates idolatry more than any other sin. And under the law of Moses, a man could be stoned to death for, being, for engaging in idolatry. Covetousness, the Bible says, is idolatry. If you covet, if you have greed, and it becomes a sin in your life, it can become idolatry. And when the Apostle Paul was walking around in Athens in his day, he looked at a city, the Bible says, given wholly to idolatry. And Paul warned the Corinthian Greeks, flee from idolatry in 1 Corinthians 10. And Paul defined a Christian to the Thessalonians as someone who had turned to God from idolatry to serve the living and the true God. Are you guilty of idolatry? Is covetousness a part of your life? Is greed a part of your life? The Bible says, keep yourself from idols in 1 John 5. Keep yourself from those idols. Is that little box that we call television, is that your idol? Do you spend time quietly worshiping in front of it? Do you spend more time with it than you do with the Lord in prayer or study of the Bible? What is your idol? We have today almost a worship of film stars, television stars, sports figures, all the rest of it. We can't help but have people in our day that have made instant celebrities on television. And we look to them and we think, oh, wouldn't it be great to be like one of them? I wish you could talk to some of them. How miserable many of them really are. How empty they are. The Bible speaks of an evil and adulterous generation, Matthew 12, 39. And Peter speaks of an unregenerate society having eyes full of adul ad uh, adultery and that cannot cease from sin. You want to give it up, but you can't. There are relationships you need to break to save your marriage, but you can't. There are thoughts that you have in your mind you'd like to get rid of and be dominated by the thinking of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, but you can't do that. You have no power. If you come to Christ tonight and open your heart to Him, He'll give you a supernatural power, the Holy Spirit, that can help you break away from those relationships, break away from those things that are wrong, break away from those things that come between you and God. You're a good man, but that's not enough. You need the new birth. You need the Holy Spirit to come from above and change your whole direction of living and change your heart and change your spirit and change your relationship to God. Judas was religious. He was the treasurer of Jesus' little band. The other disciples didn't guess that he was a traitor, but he betrayed our Lord and became one of the great people of history that we look down on as a great traitor. James 1.26 tells us of the men who say, who may seem to be religious, but deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is vain, the scripture says. Jesus said, they serve me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How many of you are like that? You go to church, you serve God with your lips, you sing the songs, you say the creeds, but your heart doesn't belong to Christ. He's not the Lord of your heart. T.W. Wilson told me a story some time ago that he met a man in France who had been tortured during the war by the Nazis, terribly tortured. His, I, I can't even describe to you in front of this crowd what was done to him. You couldn't believe it. After the war, this man felt called of God to become a preacher and he became a preacher to prison camps. And one day he was in Germany and he went to a prison camp in Germany. And he saw this man who was called the terrible Dunker, who had hurt so many people and who was responsible for so many deaths. And he went up to him and he said, Dunker, he said, do you remember me? He said, no, I don't believe I do. 
He said, my name is Reverend so-and-so. Oh, Dunker said, I do remember you. He said, Dunker, he said, if I didn't know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I would hate you and I would try to murder you. But I know Christ. And I'm asking you if you would yield your life to Christ and let God forgive you and become a Christian. Dunker looked away and he said, you mean you would ask me that after all I did to you? He said, yes, because now God gives me the ability to love you. I hate you naturally, but supernaturally with the Spirit of God living in me, I love you. And the Dunker began to cry. And he got down on his knees and gave his life to Christ. That's what God looks the way he looks at you. With mercy and love and forgiveness. He will forgive you. Is it possible to reject him so long that you cannot be forgiven? Of course. If you reject him and your heart gets hard, you may, the Holy Spirit may speak to you and convict you and woo you and give you other opportunities, but you can't hear his voice because your conscience is now dead. But even to the moment of the grave, that offer of forgiveness and salvation is open to anyone. But only the Holy Spirit can draw you and convict you and draw you to the cross. And he draws you always to the cross and to the empty tomb for the resurrection of Christ. You go to the communion on Sunday and you take of the wine or the grape juice, whatever your church serves. That wine or that grape juice stands for blood. The blood that was shed on the cross. John the Baptist cried out, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Why did he call him a lamb? Because as a lamb, he was going to the cross. His blood was to be shed for your sins. He takes away the sins of the world. And that blood tonight can cleanse every sin you've ever committed. There's power in the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Do you want forgiveness tonight? Do you want forgiveness of every single sin? Because you see, you cannot get into heaven if you're guilty of a single sin when you get to the entrance of heaven. Every sin has to be forgiven. And there's no way for sin to be forgiven except by Jesus Christ work on the cross. Now blood, of course, is symbolic in the Bible. It means the life of Christ was given for us at the cross. And when he died on that cross and shed that blood, God accepted that sacrifice instead of you having to make a sacrifice. In other words, you won't have to spend a day at the judgment. You won't have to spend one day in hell. You will be forgiven as though you had never sinned by the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. The scripture says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb, without blemish and without stain. One of the most popular songs a couple years ago was, Oh, happy day when Jesus washed my sins away. And in Revelation 12 we read, they overcame how? By the blood of the Lamb. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Jesus paid the ransom. In 1954, we went to England. And we were holding a crusade that lasted three months at uh, the Harringay Arena in London, England. And my wife is a bookworm and she loves to go to old bookstores and buy old books and just browse through old books. And she has hundreds of them that she's gotten over the years, some of the great classics. And on this occasion, she saw a little old man 
in there, well, he wasn't an old man, about a middle-aged man, and he was very discouraged and very despondent looking, and he came up to her and said, are you Mrs. Billy Graham? And she said, yes, I am. He said, well, you know, he said, I'm so discouraged. He said, my marriage is breaking up. And he said, everything is happening to me. I don't know what I'm going to do. And she said, well, why don't you come out to the Harringay Arena tonight and hear the gospel? And she gave him some tickets that she had in her bag. And she didn't see him again. Wondered what had happened to him. Prayed for him. One year later, we were back in that same city of London holding a crusade at Wembley Stadium, where incidentally it poured rain every night in the open air like this, except on the last night, and it was clear and ice cold. So we had a delightful time in the rain and in the cold. But an average of 60,000 people every night came. And on that last day, I remember we had 90,000 people in that cold air. But anyway, she went to that same bookstore. She was browsing around and this same man came. And he was bright and chipper. And Ruth said, I've never seen such happiness on the face of anybody. And he said, you know, I took the tickets. I went to the arena that night. I accepted Christ as my Savior. My wife accepted Christ, said, now we have a Christian family. And he said, you know the verse of scripture that your husband quoted that night that won me to the Lord? He said it was 102nd Psalm and he got a Bible and he showed her. I'm like a pelican in the wilderness. I'm like an owl of the desert. I watch and am a sparrow alone upon the housetop. Now I never thought of that as being an evangelistic verse. But it was to him because he said that described my condition. Because he said I felt like a pelican in the wilderness. A pelican doesn't belong in the wilderness. He belongs down at Galveston or someplace. I'm like an owl of the desert. Well, owls don't go to the desert much. And he said, that's the way I felt that night. And he said, it changed my life. Now the whole world tonight is like a pelican, an owl or a sparrow. Dickens wrote of the French Revolution in 1775 that it was the best and the worst of times. And that's what we're seeing today. Glamour Damocles in the fourth century BC said something against the king of Syracuse and he was ordered to sit under a naked sword suspended by a single hair. Now there's a difference between an optimist and a pessimist. And I heard about uh, one of our prisons, two convicts were looking out of a cell window one night and the pessimist saw only the bars. But the optimist saw the stars. And in our world we see both. I heard about one man suffering from depression, decided to commit suicide, and he jumped off one of the tall buildings about 70 stories high. And he became more and more optimistic as he went down. And when he passed the 10th floor, somebody said, how you doing? He said, I'm doing all right so far. <laughs> and in London, I remember another story about London. When we were over there, they told us the story about a, a man that was getting ready to commit suicide. He was going to jump off the London Bridge into the Thames River and commit suicide. And a policeman saw him and said, wait, 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 don't do that. Don't jump. I'll come and help you. So the policeman climbed up there and sat down beside him and tried to help him and counsel him and tell him not to jump. And so the man told the policeman all of his troubles and they both jumped in. <laughs> And that's the way some psychiatrists and some psychologists feel today. And I suppose some clergymen who have to listen to all of these stories that people are telling them about all their troubles and trials and tribulations and broken homes and drug addictions and runaway children and all the other things that they're facing. A demonstration was recently held in England, in Birmingham, England. And on the back of one t-shirt sewn in huge white letters were the words, No Future! And here in Houston this week, I've noticed the headlines and some of the stories in the Post and the Chronicle. One of them said, future of mankind in doubt. Another one said, deadlocked on the precipice of all out war, of pushing toward a nuclear showdown, disaster of catastrophe, people scared. Those are the things every day now, and we're getting so used to it that we don't realize that this terrible, cloud is gathering on the horizon 
filled with its hurricanes and its tornadoes that can tear us to bits. And then an article, I think it was in today's paper, told what would happen in a nuclear exchange that even those that survived would suffer the most terrible diseases and it might be better just to be killed in the nuclear war rather than to survive. Because even the survivors would be fighting among themselves for the little bit of food that they might be able to find. And even that would be contaminated. And then the insects that would come. All the terrible things. And we laugh at that and smile at that, but that's a reality. That's a possibility. In, our, in this decade, that's how serious it is. Perhaps the most adulated and pampered woman of this century just had a widely heralded biography published on her life and she's described as having in her heart been a very sad person all of her life and yet she made people on the screen laugh. Francis Mitterrand, the president of France, said last week that ours is a tragic world. Everything is a struggle, he said. After the death of President Sadat and Moshe Dayan, who played a major role at Camp David, Lord Chalfon of England said, the prospects for peace in the Middle East are really terrible. Now, after one single act of violence and terror, the Middle East stands once more on the brink of war. And Jesus once said there would be a time like that, a time upon the earth when there would be distress of nations with perplexity. That word distress means pressure. The word perplexity means no way out. There'll come a time when the economic and the military problems will become so great that there'll be no way that man can figure his way out. It'll be the end. And many people think we're almost there now. Johnny Cash wrote a song. Matthew 24 is knocking at the door. That's the name of the song. Matthew 24 tells all about the signs of the times and the coming again of Jesus Christ. And we read all over the world of assassination attempts. One of our embassy leaders in France was shot at today. Six times they shot at him. He ducked behind his bulletproof limousine. That's the only thing that saved him. And that's almost daily now. Terrorist attacks everywhere. And then there comes your own personal problems the boredom, the children that are in rebellion. Yesterday, we read of a 31-year-old son of one of America's most wealthy and influential families, you'd know his name if I called him, who left America for India with this resolve. Here's what he said, quoted in the press. I renounce capitalism. I renounce communism. I come to India to settle here permanently to have the grace of the Supreme God. And with this, he assumed a brand new name forgetting his past, becoming a new name, hoping that there somewhere at the feet of a guru, he'll find the answer. One night we were leaving India about three years ago and we went to the New Delhi airport. We had been up in the northeastern part of India, preaching up in the mountains. And at the Delhi airport, it was jammed with American students. They were lying all over the place, university students. And I said, who are these people? They said there are three 747s coming to pick them up. They've been here studying at the feet of some guru and they're going back disillusioned. Young people searching for something, anything to find peace and happiness in a world that seems to have gone mad and insane. Nothing seems to make sense to some of our young people anymore. And then they read about some of their heroes. And many of the people that are your heroes and many of the people that you think are at the top are really in their hearts at the bottom. Searching. They don't find it in all this popularity. They don't find it in all the adulation. They don't find it in all the popularity. They don't find it in money. They don't find it in some other philosophy. But they can find it in Jesus Christ. And so can you. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. Jesus said, a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. There's something deeper in your life that you need that materialism cannot satisfy. Money cannot satisfy. Pleasure cannot satisfy. And one of the things that you need is the forgiveness of sin. 
because all of us have sinned against God. And the word sin means lawbreaker. You are a breaker of the laws of God, and so am I. And the Bible says that you have, if you have broken in one point, you have broken all of God's laws. So we are breakers of all of God's laws, and there is a penalty for breaking the law of God, and that penalty is death and destruction and judgment and hell. That's the penalty. And we're all under sentence. We're like Damocles sitting under that naked sword. We're already under condemnation. We're not going to be condemned when we die. We're condemned now. We're already under condemnation. And Jesus came to save us from that condemnation and from the penalty of that sin. The Bible, thank God, assures wonderful forgiveness for all sin. Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are for covered. God can forgive you because of the cross. Because on the cross, Jesus Christ died for our sins. And because he was willing to die, God can now forgive you and remain just. You see, God had a problem. How could God forgive the sinner and remain just and holy and righteous? Because if God had come along and patted us on the back and said, you're forgiven, he would have been a liar. And if God had been a liar, he would have not been God. Somebody had to pay the penalty. You and I are guilty. Who's going to pay the penalty? Jesus paid it. That's the reason he came. We sing that song, Jesus paid it all. He paid it all. That's the reason the word blood is used in scripture because the word blood stands for life. He gave his life for us on the cross. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. And it's wonderful to know that all your sins are covered by the blood of Christ.